Welcome to Champagne Problems. We are your hosts, Robbie Shaw and Patrick Balsley. Thank you for joining us on this journey as we explore our mental health, well-being, performance, and longevity, and how our relationships with alcohol can influence each. No shame, no labeling, no judgment, just curiosity. Welcome back, friends. Today we're speaking with Brenda Zane. Brenda is the founder of Hope Stream Community, a nonprofit collection of support and educational services for parents of adolescents and young adults struggling with substance use and mental health challenges. Brenda's mission began when she nearly lost her own son to addiction. That experience continues to fuel her passion and has led her to creating a safe and resourceful space for thousands of families going through similar struggles. Let's go to Brenda. <laughs> Brenda Zane, welcome to Champagne Problems. <laughs> Thank you. So good to be here. Well, we appreciate you coming on. So you're in Seattle. I I am in Seattle. Well, I live in Seattle at the very moment. I'm on Camino Island, which is an hour north of Seattle. Yes. But I live in Seattle. Yes. Very cool. Are you? Is that kind of your your area? Are you from there? Born and raised. No way. Yeah. Very One of cool. the few left because it's so transient with. Microsoft and Starbucks and you know yeah. that little there's this little company called Amazon yeah um Heard of you it. know so we have a lot of people going in and out but yeah I was born and raised that is awesome so we're gonna get to know you real quick ask you some rapid fire questions <laughs> put you on the spot Terrible. <laughs> they're very easy very okay. very easy what's your first live music concert first live music concert was the go-go's yes it's, that's yeah. fantastic Yep. Was it in Seattle? I take it. It was at the Seattle. What it used to be the Seattle Center. There was a. It's now. I think it's. Well, it was Key Arena. I don't know. I haven't kept up on all the arenas, but yeah, it's now where. Um, I think it's the Kraken play there. The Kraken. We have a hockey team in Seattle now. It's an interesting name. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. The Go Go's. Very cool. The Go Go's. If someone were to warn us about you, what would they say? She's impossible to eat with. <laughs> really? That's, that's an interesting one. That's a great one. Well, the next question should be pretty interesting. What food is your guilty pleasure? <laughs> oh, um, no food. I have food issues. So okay. If Got I it. don't have to eat, that's that's the guilty pleasure, which is very <laughs> that's a whole other episode. <laughs> uh, a whole other episode. Understood. I'm I'm the opposite. I have a food problem, but it's more consumption based. Um, <laughs> what is your least favorite word? Oh, least favorite word. And we we're R rated on this. If you care to cuss, Ooh. so feel free. Gosh, I love words actually. So that's an interesting question for somebody that loves words. Um, well, I would I would actually say addict, which is a whole nother episode. Yeah, we'll, we'll, <laughs> dig, into yeah, we'll, we'll dig, dig into that. Yeah, we'll dig into that. I, I like yeah. that. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> All right, and here's an easy one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> if you could know the answer to any question, what would you ask? Is the world going to be okay? Mm. Lovely. A good one, too. Big question right now. The answer is yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. The world's going to be fine. <laughs> well, we then I'm done here. Okay, I'm like, but, but good the to world, go. Yeah, the world will be just fine. Um, all right. So thank you for that. Yeah. Now we know you. <laughs> yes. Um, so let's, uh, let's go into... I assume with the work you do, obviously we've done our research that you're fairly open, or at least I'm, I'm being presumptuous, but open to your journey that led you to this work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's do that first. If you're, if you're open to, to, to sharing yeah. some of that journey. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm an open book on that. It's great. Um, it's one of those things that because so many people aren't, and I get why they're not, it's, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. It's just that because families don't talk about their children who are struggling with addiction, it just perpetuates the yeah, problem right. in a lot of ways. And you guys both know this. Um, so yeah, I had, um, oh, I've, as I said, I have four boys, two of my own and two that I um, gained bonus kids with my second marriage. And 
we were kind of going along. Um, and I started noticing that my 13, 14 year old was, he was always um, a challenging child, but I was noticing some additional challenges. And by the time he was 16, um, he was doing um, cross state drug deals and disappearing for multiple days at a time, um, coming home extreme, you know, just so drunk that we would go sleep next to him to make sure that he woke up in the morning. So huge problem. Um, and, you know, I just felt that isolation of like, oh my gosh, I'm the only one who has a kid who's doing this. What did I do wrong? What did we do wrong as a family? And, um, so just going through that alone and not knowing where to turn, not having any resources, we didn't have addiction in our family. So this was like a meteor had hit me. I was like, what is this? I don't even, I didn't even understand what it was. I didn't know what I was dealing with. Fortunately, I got connected with an educational consultant who helped families kind of navigate the whole crazy treatment world and figure out what's the right resource, especially when you have a 15 or 16 year old, what do you, you can't just like say, well, go figure it out, yeah. <laughs> you know, hit rock bottom and I'll see you when you get better. Like that doesn't work when they're, you're legally responsible for them. So there's, it's a really confusing time. Um, he, he's actually somebody you should have on this story is so unreal. Um, he had, we call him like the cat that has 18 lives. Cause he's, he's still going, he's still with us, which is a miracle. Um, he went through multiple treatments, all kinds of relapses. Um, and when he was 19, he had two fentanyl overdoses in three days. And so, yeah. And that was after, you know, how many times in jail and hospital and disappearing and the police in my living room. I mean, I have this just memory seared into my head of the police standing in my living room saying, your son will be dead or in jail very soon. And this is high, this is like after he dropped out of high school. So he was 16, 17. So that, you know, that's a horrifying place to be as a parent. Um, so yeah, I got a phone call. I was actually here in this house. Um, we have a summer place on Island on this Island, Camino Island and got a phone call from a girl on a Friday night. It was nine o'clock. I'm like, huh, I know where my one kid is. And, and my oldest son, I hadn't talked to him for probably almost a month. He was 19 at that time and kind of on his own living. He was homeless. He didn't, I, he couldn't live with us. Um, so it was a horrible, horrible situation and got a phone call and this young girl's voice said, um, your son overdosed and he's in the hospital. I think you might want to go. And then the phone died. And I was like, like your whole world just like stops. And so I dialed her back and I was like, who are you? Like, who is this? What, you know, what are you talking about? She said, I, I, I don't want to say he's at Northwest hospital. You, you need to go. And so, you know, that just starts a whole um, chain of events. Cause that was an hour. The hospital was an hour away from where I was. And when I got there and the doctor pulled me aside and he said, did you know that he was here on Wednesday also? This was a Friday night. He's like, did you know he was also here on Wednesday for an overdose? I was like, wow. but he was 19. So you don't know, right? His homies came and picked him up. Yeah. So yeah. So he um, was on life support for three days and the doctor said, get your family here. This is usually where we lose them. And so we did, we got the whole family there. Um, and he actually pulled through, which, you know, none of the doctors in the hospital can figure it out. The neurologist would come back and redo his CT, his CT scans and all of the things. Cause she's like, they're all coming back normal. And they just couldn't figure it out. Cause he was found in the backseat of a car. He was foaming at the mouth. He had no pulse. They did CPR for 30 minutes and they're like, well, we're not getting a pulse, but we'll intubate him and bring him to the hospital. Jeez. So the fact that he's alive wow. and has no brain damage, because that was the other thing they said, well, if he lives, he'll 
very likely be a vegetable because you know he was atrophied and his eyes were rolled up in his head and the doctor at one point pulled me aside and he said I don't know what you do for work but he's probably going to be your new full-time job oh, I was like god oh how long ago was this this was in 2017 so six years ago and so life changes pretty quickly <laughs> when you go through that um and the good news is he's he's great today he's actually working at the residential treatment program for um, adolescents that he ran away from one of his many escapades awesome. <laughs> he ran away from the treatment program um, but he works there now and he's that helping so young cool. guys and you know he's he's the real deal and he can just tell them bro if you run from this place <laughs> let me just let me just play this movie forward for you of how that can go so um yeah. So that's how I got into it. And when you see your child dead and then you try to go back to your old life, which I had a great career in advertising. I was, I worked for all the big brands, P and G and Nike and Microsoft and, you know, Miller Coors and you name it, Frito-Lay did all kinds of amazing stuff. And I was sitting there. And at one point, my two accounts that I was running were Hawaiian airlines so I was required to be in Hawaii every five weeks. Not a bad gig. Bummer. And Chateau Saint-Michel Winery. Interesting. Mm. <laughs> I was a, I marketed <laughs> wine to mothers, Chardonnay oh, to mothers. That was my job. Um, and when you do that, and I just, after a while, you know, it was about two years later after his last overdose. And I was like, what am I doing? What am I doing? <laughs> this is insane. Because I knew I had gone through it alone and I knew that parents needed help and education because it's not just, you don't just need a place to like boohoo and this is, this sucks. And man, you know, you need education because they're, you know, with um, there's craft, the craft approach, which um, I think you guys are familiar with. Like there's so much that parents can do that I didn't know anything about that I figured, well, if I could at least like, I'm not a therapist. I'm not a doctor. I don't know any of that stuff, but I do know what it's like to live through that hell when you're seeing your child disintegrate in front of you in a really ugly way. Um, I just knew that there was stuff that I could teach parents that would help them motivate their kid, like relate to their child and motivate them to get some help or to at least start making positive change for themselves and so left the corporate world and started, started helping parents. That's, that's the story. <laughs> can you, can, can we talk about craft for a minute? Can you kind of give us a high level view of what that is and, and, and why it works and how you've seen it work? Absolutely. And, and it's my, my favorite topic. <laughs> yeah. And before you start, thank you for sharing all that. Yeah. yeah. That was very yeah. powerful. We appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's one of those things that you, you literally think, well, that could never, you know, you hear stories and you're like, that would never happen to my family. Like, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. So about craft it's community reinforcement and family training. It is the worst acronym of all time because people <laughs> talk about it and people are like, you do crafts with people. Like, how does that help? <laughs> <laughs> it's like we're hot gluing stuff on. No, so it's, just eat a bunch of mac and cheese and everything. Yeah, it's so so. It's an unfortunate acronym, but what it is is it's an approach that families can use to. You use psychology basically. So there's actions that you can take. There's there's an understanding that you need to have some education, and then there's a mindset that if you put all those together, you can actually change the way that you relate to your child and have conversations with them and act in a way that increases the chances and their motivation to actually make positive change in their life. So we see it every single day. Um, just like quick example would be focus on the positive, not on the negative and use positive reinforcement. So like, when's the last time you changed? Cause somebody shamed you into like, Oh, yeah. you know, yeah. you've gained those 15 pounds, like you're terrible and you suck. And uh. so <laughs> <You get> worse. <laughs> yeah. 
So it's, and a lot of parents will think that that's enabling. It's like, well, I can't be nice to my 16 year old cause he's smoking weed all day like that, you know, then I'm enabling them. Um, but what you can do is you can find those positive little things. And, and I often tell parents there got to a point where I couldn't really find anything positive that my son was doing. So I started talking about like, you know, I'm really glad that you slept at your friend's house last night, even though I didn't, I wasn't really, but that was a better choice than driving home under the influence or, you know, at, at least he came home for a day or, you know, Hey, thanks for not yelling at your brother when he wanted to use the Xbox, like just finding small positive because every conversation starts to get really negative. Every conversation becomes a lesson. Every conversation becomes, you're not doing this and you're not doing that. And how come you're not going to school? And can't you see your future and blah, 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 blah. And what kid is going to want to come home to that? Like, of course, you know, and I didn't know any of this when I was going through it. So I did everything absolutely wrong. So I can completely relate. I was the mom who was crying in the closet every day. Can't you see what you're doing to me? Can't you see you're killing your dad? Can't you see you're killing me? Aren't you afraid that you're going to die? Aren't you afraid that you're never going to have a future? And just like piling on the shame, piling on guilt, piling on, you know, and, and really making him responsible for me and my emotions and my feelings. And so that's a big part of what craft does is it, is it teaches us to not put all that onto our kids to understand there's a reason that they're using. And I think that's the biggest misperception is like, well, he's just, he's just a bad kid. He's just one of those kids. He's, you know, um, and what I found out later, phase. yeah, it's a phase or, you know, it's just like his dad or it's just like his mom or just like his grandpa or whatever. Um, but they're, you know, they're using substances for a reason. And what we didn't know at the time was that uh, my divorce from my son's dad just imploded his world at the age of 10. But on the outside, he didn't show that. And so, um, and it was an amicable divorce. His dad would come over for dinner every week and we'd go on vacation together. So on the surface, it all looked fine, but he's that sensitive, he, like he's the poster child for somebody who's going to fall into really bad habits and addiction, ADD, highly sensitive, highly um, intelligent, you know, from a like we had him tested and he's gifted in all kinds of ways. And just one of those kids that when something like that happens, what he told us later is, well, as soon as I found that out, my, just like my family was gone. I had no family anymore, even though he did, his perception was that he didn't. And so the family that he found was the gang members, the drug dealers, like the people that just scooped him up and they were like, you know, where are your family now? And so that's, that's what led there. But yeah, craft is just, it, it's, it's almost a little too simple sometimes that families are like, well, how's that going to change anything? But I see it every single day in our communities. I'll have parents come on and be like, I tried that thing that you said and it worked. And I sat and I had a conversation with my son for an hour and we didn't yell at each other and we didn't scream and there was no hole punched in the wall. And I was like, yes. That can happen. <laughs> so yeah, it's pretty incredible. Wow. Today's episode is sponsored by Athletic Brewing Company, America's leading non-alcoholic craft brewer. Have you been thinking about cutting back on alcohol but still aren't sure if near beers are for you? Check out Athletic Brewing, the most decorated non-alcoholic brewer in the world. Athletic produces a wide selection of great tasting brews, including IPAs, Goldens, Darks, Lights, Sours, and more. Their non-alcoholic beers have won over 70 awards and are fit for all time, so you can drink them anytime and anywhere. Now you can enjoy great tasting craft brews all night long and still be ready for whatever life throws at you tomorrow. Right now, new Athletic customers can receive 20% off their first order when they visit athleticbrewing.com and use the code CP20 at checkout by August 31st, 2023. Well, tell us about Hope Stream, kind of how that evolved and, and it, how it continues. Yeah, did it start? Like, I want to know about the podcast and about the community, but like, which one, how did it 
What was the Genesis story behind that? I mean, after kind of everything that you went through? Well, I, um, so I got, so I left the corporate world, got trained as a health and wellness coach, um, wanted, I knew I wanted to work with moms in particular to help them through this because, you know, I lost my, my physical health, my mental health, um, stopped working out. I just, I became just nothing like it was. And I, and I just kept seeing more and more women going through this. As I started talking about it, people come out of the woodwork. They're like, Oh wait, I, I I'm also like, I have a kid doing this. And I just saw the, this, this like shell of women sitting in front of me on these coaching sessions. And I was like, okay, this is not good. We have a whole group of women in particular who are getting fired from their jobs or they're leaving their jobs. They're leaving their community work that they're doing because they're so focused on this child. So I started just doing coaching one-on-one -on -one and I realized it's like the starfish story, right? I'm like, yeah. this is not, I'm not throwing enough starfish back. Like I got to, <laughs> somehow I need to scoop up like buckets of starfish. Buckets. <laughs> right. And so I was working with a business coach and I was like, how, you know, I can't do this. And maybe I could do group coaching. And I said, I feel like I just need a bigger megaphone. And she said, I literally said that. And she said, that's called a podcast. <laughs> I was like, I, I think I'd maybe listened to two podcasts by that point, because this was in 2019. And she said, no, you can do it. I was like, well, I'm not a podcaster. And she said, literally buy a microphone and plug it into your computer and just start talking. Yeah. I was like, then you're a podcaster. Oh. I was like, <laughs> I guess I could do that. So that's how the podcast started, um, January of 2020. And then COVID hit. Because in my mind, I was like, I'm going to have this podcast. I'm going to go around speaking. You know, I'm going to go travel country and talk at high schools and blah, blah, blah. And then that all shut down. And so what I really realized is that the parents I was working with really wanted to talk to each other because you get so isolated. You don't talk to your friends anymore. You don't go out and do fun stuff because your world just like shrinks into this little box of like, I'm a terrible parent. My kid's on drugs, you know, I got to, I got to figure out how to save them. And so I found this community um, platform and I was like, well, I mean, the kind of the good news is going into it. I had no idea what I was doing. So you just kind of do it. And so I started for moms and I guess I opened the stream in March, no, April, March or April of 2020, that whole time, as you know, is a blur. And I started writing articles because I had a zero email list, zero social media, like zero, because I'd been in the corporate world forever. And the mom started showing up. It's like, I get the little ding when somebody joined. I was like, oh my gosh, I got a mom. It's happening. It's happening. Yeah. And so, the, and then that evolved into opening the woods, which is for dads, because the moms in the community were like, well, my partner, my husband has noticed that I'm different. I'm not yelling anymore. I'm not screaming anymore. I'm not crying in the closet anymore. Uh, my, my child and I are having a relationship and they're like, what is going on with you? Like what's happening? Yeah. When'd you get so mature? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like what's that secret sauce you got going on over there? So we opened the community for dads. So then we had the podcast and we had these two communities and then People were like, well, I don't know if I want to join a community, but I really like that workshop that I heard about that you do about boundaries and how do you set boundaries when your kid's on drugs. And so then we started doing that. So it just all became very fragmented and the marketer and me was going a little crazy because I'm like, I like things to be neat and tidy and branded. And so we took all of that and pulled that into a nonprofit called Hopestream Community. So now it's just one big community with, you know, we do this for moms and we do this for dads. You can take workshops, you can take courses. We do retreats, which are amazing. We just got back from four days in upstate New York. We were at um, Auto Camp in Saugerties. If you don't know about Auto Camp, it is amazing. We had 11 moms who left their kids in all different stages of crisis and treatment and recovery and everything in between. And so, yeah, it's just, it's that gathering place. Cause when you are that parent and you look around and you're like, where are we hanging out? Like, where do all of us hang out together where we don't have to be embarrassed? We don't have to minimize 
You know, you can say, I haven't heard from my kid in three weeks or my kid just, you know, came home on an ankle monitor at the age of 16. And they're like, everyone's like, yeah, okay. What's for lunch? You know, <laughs> right. like we don't. So that's how Hope's Dream community all came together. <laughs> can can we kind of talk about the, you know, the different stages that you see and kind of touch on maybe each one of those just for our listeners? Because I know we're probably going to have some people that are, you know, in the situation that you were where there, it's more of a severe situation. And then you're going to have some that are moderate that are like, can like really concerned, but they don't know what to do. And then more kind of on the preventative lens of like, Hey, you know, I, my kid came home high, but he's making straight A's and who, uh, you know, we don't really know how to have this conversation with him. Like does hope stream deal with all of that? Yes. So that's a great question because the stages can be really confusing because when you're also dealing with a teenager who doesn't have a prefrontal cortex, it's like, is this, is this substances? Is this normal teenager? And what I always say is if you, if you're keeping the connection with them, even though they're not like the snuggly, like, Oh, you know, like they were when they were 10 or 11 or whatever, um, if you still got that connection, even if they're rolling their eyes at you sometimes or whatever, you're you're probably okay because there are tons of kids who just experiment and they smoke some weed and they're like, eh, I could take it or leave it, right? It's the same with alcohol. It's like, oh, I could take it or leave it. But then you're going to have those kids and it's right around 12 to 15% now of adolescents in particular. So the kids who are between 12 and 18 and even up to 24 who will actually have a substance use disorder diagnosis. And so when you see, if you just start to see some of that coming home and they look a little high or they're clearly under the influence or their, their friend group has completely changed and you're like, who are all these kids that I don't know anymore? Um, some kids can keep their grade point up. There's lots of kids that can do that, but there's a lot of kids. One of the you know clear signs is that drop in grades because sleep gets impacted. They can't, you know, they're not showing up at school. So, so grades can be a good indicator, but not always, which is the tricky part about this is really having a pulse on just, you know, your kid, like, you know, them and you know, when something is off and it's really easy when you, if you want to put your head in the sand to just be like, oh, it's the teenage thing. Oh, all the kids are doing it. Oh, it's just weed. Um, and I could do a whole nother episode on high potency THC, but, um, <laughs> when you start to see those little things and you're getting the little, you know, parents have a great intuition and you're getting that little, like eh, something is just yeah. not right. That's what you want right. to, that's what you want to jump on because with fentanyl in the market today, and with the high potency THC, the, the, the pace at which these kids are getting into trouble has just accelerated. So, you know, my son sort of went between 13 and 15 slowly. Like I didn't really notice it. He was really good at hiding it. Um, and then it just like hit all of a sudden he disappeared for two weeks and was doing a drug deal in California. Like it was wild. Um, but you're going to start to see some of those little indicators and those are the ones to tap into and to start to have a conversation. So that's not when you need to just jump into like, oh, I got to get them into treatment. Oh, I got to send them out to wilderness therapy, which I love wilderness therapy at the right time. But that's when you can just start to have the conversation. And this is a craft skill is to say, hey, what's right about this? Like, what, what does we do for you? Like, what's good about it? What problem is it solving? Because it's doing something. They wouldn't do it if it wasn't doing something. And a lot of kids struggle with anxiety, especially after COVID. Kids have been in their rooms for two years. And then we're like, well, you just got to go back to school. The anxiety that can cause in a lot of kids yeah. is massive. It's huge. Um, or, or depression or just being socially awkward. Kids who are on the autism spectrum, you know, like that, that whole verbal and like, oh, wow, if I have a beer, all of a sudden I'm Joe cool. Like I could talk to anybody. And so starting the conversation about what's right about it is actually a really good place to start because you're going to start to understand what problem is this solving for them? 
And if you can get it young enough, you can say, okay, cool. I understand that school makes you really anxious. Let's look at some other ways to deal with that, whether that's a different school situation, whether that's meditation or whatever, whatever, and any other tool that can be healthier, because you guys know substances work really well, really fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had and, a dad tell me this morning, I was on a call with a dad this morning and, uh, telling me that his young young son he came outside and it was like 7, 7 a.m and his son smoking weed out on their porch mm -hmm. and he was just like what's going on dude like what's up with this so i was like well it just it just makes my day more interesting right yeah you know? right. yeah quick question that's somewhat of a segue from what you were just talking about um you know a lot of clients that i work with are are are, are parents and one question I've I've been dealing with recently uh, is is the quick jump into a mental disorder. Um, you know, well, I've I looked up on Google or or even maybe even the DSM, and 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 he meets criteria for borderline personality, and 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 you know, it's it's like they make this huge jump into this <laughs> really severe place, and while that is obviously a possibility a lot of us just are over informed around certain things and it's, we are filled with fear. All of us are to a degree. And so, uh, you know, can you speak to, to, to some of the parents who, and what I mean by speak to, how should they attack that? How should they assess that? What's the easiest way to get a kid who's 13 to 17 to possibly comply with some sort of assessment? Yes. You know? super difficult and it and right. a lot of it depends on your age of consent so in washington state our age of consent is 13. so the day your child turns 13 you get no medical information you cannot get information from the therapist you can't get information from a doctor that is insane it's 13 insane who makes a good decision between 13 and <laughs> eight? like nobody nobody so that's a great question because your hands, it dep again, depending on your state, my hands were tied. You know, we, we had our, we kind of tricked, our, this, I would not recommend this. We tricked our son into getting a, um, you know, like a evaluation. And the only thing that the person who did it, she came out of the room and she looked at me and she said, your son has an amazing capacity for substance use. Like her eyes were like this big. She said, it's astounding. And that's all she could tell me. Oh, thanks lady. Yeah. Thanks. You know, and so um, we, you know, we, I think Dr. Google is one of the scariest <laughs> places <laughs> for parents when, when your child starts using substances, because it, it, it's terrifying. So I would say, number one, go to your pediatrician, you know, depending on their age, but go to your pediatrician and get a really good about, you know, evalu uh, psychological evaluation with a psychiatrist who is trained to do psychological evaluations, not the school psychologist, because the school psychologist is looking at it from an academic lens. And I will hear so many parents will say, oh yeah, we had a psyche eval. And I'm like, where did you have a psyche eval? Oh, the school had, no, 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 no. You need to go to a psychiatrist, psychologist, sorry, psychologist, um, to really understand that because the psychologist, they also need to understand what substances are at play because high potency THC today is causing psychosis in kids that looks like bipolar disorder, it looks like, mm -hmm. you know, um, whatever. And so they need to understand what substances are at play. And as far as getting the kid to agree to it, <laughs> I mean, that's where you have to use the, those skills to have a conversation that's ongoing. It's not a one-time talk. It's not like, okay, we're going to have the talk. Um, and to say, we're, we're really concerned. And we, we find that kids really do care about their brains. They, they're they using substances that are hurting their brains to you know deal with the emotions. But if you can get some of the basic data through to them about what THC is doing to their brain, um, what kinds of problems they can be encountering down the road. And 
to take away the shame and just say, Hey, I get it. It worked for you. Like it totally worked. And, and now it's not working because you feel really paranoid and you're super anxious and all of that stuff. And really relating to that and saying, I get it, man, like that sucks, but let's see if we can find another way to deal with it yeah. where you're not making it like, Oh, you're that kid. You're the, you know, you're the problem in the family. You're the black sheep of the family. Um, that can start to, to make them open. Cause a lot of these kids are starting to have such real problems, um, that they're, that they're actually coming to their parents. And I hear this every day, these kids will come and say, mom, something's really wrong with my brain. Like something's really wrong. And so if you can be open to that conversation, then to be able to say, Hey, let's just have you talk to this person and find out what's going on, get that psyche valve to inform what, if treatment's necessary, what kind of treatment would be best for them. Um, so that you're out of the gate, you're going in the right direction. Cause a lot of parents will be like, Oh my gosh, my kid used weed once I'm sending them away. And that's really not the route that you want to go. You want to do a lot of investigation first, because there's great local programs that you might be able to get them into, um, to start out with. So you, you just have to be able to get the right resources in there. Yeah. That's what I always tell families how important it is to get like a real good evaluation or assessment and not just, yeah. Oh, well, my next door neighbor had a son that you know, struggled with this and he went to this place and it right. must be good, you know? And, right. You know, though he's sober now, so <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, it took him so, 10 years. But, yeah, yeah. But it's, hey, it must be, it must be right. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's do a, um, just in the spirit of time, I, I do want to, I know we could do an entire episode on weed, but let's oh. touch on it a little bit just yeah. because it's so common and it's exactly what most of our listeners are likely dealing with, if not going to. Absolutely. Yeah, can well, you I... give us some stats? I mean, do you have like some stats like offhand there? Or, I mean, if you don't, but like, then what are you seeing? Yes. Um, I don't have a lot of stats. I just did an episode though. Um, I don't have the, I should have the episode number, uh, with Dr. Libby Stout. So, um, that would be one to look at. Uh, she's an expert. She's a addiction psychologist in Colorado. <laughs> Col oh, nice. yes. I saw this when I was looking at your podcast. Plenty of oh my data, goodness. Sure. Just, can we all just have a moment for the parents in Colorado? Because it is horrible. Um, well, what we're seeing is younger and younger. So 13, 14, 15, what's happening is the kids are getting really high potency THC. So upwards of 90, 95%, um, they're getting it in all different formats. And, you know, the, the good thing about just rolling a joint was that it was going to be lower lower THC. The problem with rolling a joint is it smells, it takes time, right? It takes all these things and you can't hide it very well. Um, edibles are really easy to hide. Vape pens are really easy to hide. So the high potency formats are actually much easier for kids to hide. And so, and they're super available because seniors in high school are often 18, which means they can have a medical marijuana card, which you can buy off the internet in 10 minutes no doctor, like there it's, there's no medical intervention at all. So the seniors have access to buying, uh, thousands of milligrams a day. And so they're becoming the dealers to the younger kids. And so I think a lot of times parents will, will think in their mind, they think drug dealer is some sketchy looking guy in an alley you know, like downtown, wherever you live, it's actually the 18 year old senior at the high school who has a medical marijuana card and now has a dispensary of their own. They're, you know, selling in the high schools and so, and middle schools. And so the kids are starting to use before school, during school, after school. And because like the vape pens and all that, there's no smell, there's no anything they can do it at school. They can do it on the bus. They can do it wherever. And, and there's no knowledge and they're really 
having, you know, it's working for a while and by a while, I mean months, not years. And then the anxiety and the paranoia and the, you know, the FBI is after me and just they're, they're starting to see these um, problems so fast and parents are just watching their kids just change. I mean, it, the, the way that parents, like I see their faces on our calls and they're just terrified. And so it's happening really fast and it's happening to younger and younger kids. And so what, what, um, the doctors are saying, cause I listen to doctors cause I'm not a doctor. So I listen to the doctors and what they're saying is because of the potency kids really need to be away and abstain for a minimum of 120 days, meaning they really need to be in some sort of an inpatient program. Because when you take a 16 year old and you try to make them sober and not do anything in the same high school where they were yeah. using with their friends, yeah. it's impossible. No chance. That's yeah. an impossible ask. And so they really do need to be away. Um, I would love to see programs that just exist for THC and, you know, mental health, obviously that combination, because um, the need is only going to get bigger and they've got to be like, you have to yank them out of that situation just for the, the brain to heal, let alone the mental health and all the trauma, whatever they're dealing with. Um, and there are kids, I just had a gal on the podcast, um, not long ago, who her son had no history of mental health, no history of trauma, no, there's no mental health diagnosis in their family. And he became psychotic. He ended up committing suicide and he only ever used high potency THC. And that was at, I think he was 19 when he committed suicide. So um, it's serious. And so when parents and I said this, I'm like, well, I, well, it's just weed. I would rather yeah, have him smoking weed, weed yeah. than doing all these other things. Sure Little did that. I know that my son was using fentanyl, but, um, you know, that's not it anymore. In a, yeah. in a, it's not harm reduction anymore. No. I mean, I guess if your kid's smoking fentanyl and then they decide to not do that anymore. Sure. Okay. For a while. But I think the harm reduction that parents need to understand with THC is that it is a process. It's not the end point. So yes, a step down to THC from fentanyl or meth or something like that, hundred yeah. yeah. percent, but then they need to keep going. Um, yeah. so and then is, you got the whole like healthcare system piece on top of that. I mean, you got to uh, pull a kid out of their environment for four months. Like good luck yeah. doing that for less than a hundred thousand dollars. Oh, for you sure. Know. And try to find an insurance company that will cover um, a tenth of it. Cannabis use disorder. Yeah. Right. Like, no, it's out, a so joke. outpatient outpatient treatment. Yep. You know, yeah. Give you a hundred dollars a week to go to therapy. Yes. So it's a it's a giant challenge for parents to find a way to get your kid away. Like there is no foster. We need, actually, that's what we need is a foster system. Like, okay, my kid lives here and your kid lives there. Let's just yeah. see if we can swap. Them. We have a, we have a recovery <laughs> high school here. So that, yes. that definitely helps. And it's more economical. Um, than Absolutely. Oh, treatment. love. Yes. Um, I, and, and we also have, and, and I don't know what the situation is in Seattle, but we have, um, we have Delta eight here. And it's high potency. It's you know, edibles and pens. It's legal weed. Yeah, but it's it's also unregulated. So there's no it, people don't know what's in it. There's yeah. all these synthetics now that are just yeah yeah. yeah. And it's sold Terrifying. everywhere. And these kid yeah, I mean some of the kids that I work with are telling me they have got you know all kinds of you know, cyclical vomiting and all kinds yes. of crazy like weird withdrawal symptoms from these synthetic. THC products. Mm. Yes. Yeah. CHS is a real thing. Um, cannab uh, cannabinoid hyperemesis. Again, I'm not a doctor. Yeah. Um, where yes, that the constant vomiting and they're ending up in emergency rooms. Yep. And especially in states where, where it's not legal, the emergency rooms aren't picking up on this all the time. Again, this yeah. is from a doctor. It's not for me. Um, because 
they're, it's just not registering that these people, and it's not just kids, it's older people too, but the constant vomiting, they're having to put them on antipsychotic meds that are, that are able to control the vomiting a little bit. Um, but if they return to use, they're going to, they're going to have the same issue. So it's, it's a real thing and it's so, so scary. Um, I just, yeah, I mean, that's, and that's why we focus on craft and that's why we focus on trying to, you're never going to stop the supply. Like people are like, Oh, what are we going to yeah. do about fentanyl? Shut the we gotta, borders down. Yeah. We got it. It's like, that's, you're never, ever, ever going to stop the supply. So we no. have to try to change the demand factor. And the only way that you can do that as a parent is to have that relationship with your child. Don't be afraid to talk about it and, and start to try and help them understand that they are going to have to motivate themselves to do it because as we know, we can't change anyone else. So, um, that's, that's the only thing that you can really do as a parent is keep that relationship. Don't shut them out. Don't kick them out. Don't, you know, cut them off. You've got to keep the relationship um, to the point where where they will come to you and you will be that safe place for them to come when they do need help um, because you don't want them going to the homies, right? They're, mm. they're not going to help yeah. them. You kind of being in your own recovery process and finding all this new information, how has that changed your, your life? You know, give us like the three, the top three, you know, takeaways or, or, you know, benefits. Yeah. Benefits. Yeah. I love that you said being in recovery because I definitely consider myself in recovery from huge trauma. Um, it was so wonderful to get, uh, to have a therapist. I went to EM through EMDR therapy, um, for my trauma and just to be validated, to have a therapist say, of course you're traumatized. <laughs> like, so um, I think just validation of the yeah. fact that I, I've i gone through huge trauma. When you see your kid dead, when you see your kid beat up in the hospital from the drug dealer, when you see, you know, when you know your child is dealing drugs and the impact of that. So I think just validate and then knowing that I am in recovery from that. Um, I've also changed my entire way of being in my body. Um, I used to drink every single day. I was a big wine drinker. I sold wine. I mean, that was my job was to market wine. To, that's a whole episode we could do <laughs> to market wine to moms. Um, <laughs> that's a crazy thing. Yeah, so, you know, I've mm -hmm. radically changed my relationship to alcohol, to food, to my body, um, just giving myself permission to be nice to myself is huge. Um, and then I think just having massive amounts of compassion for people who are struggling. I used to be the parent who would drive by the kid at the end of the freeway that's sitting there holding the sign. And I'd be like, he had good parents. <laughs> he wouldn't be sitting there. Right. And then when, right. when you're driving and you're looking and wondering, yeah. is that my son? And I would literally pull off the freeway and see a kid and I'd be like, is, is that him? Is that him? Cause I didn't know where he was. And so now I, I mean, I'm the person who will pull over and sit down with that kid and be like, have you called your mom? Like, can we call your mom and, or buy them food? Mm -hmm. I remember calling my son and saying, is it okay to buy this? I can see this kid's high. I know, but he's sitting on the sidewalk. Can I buy him a burger? Like, is that okay? And my son was like, mom, don't do that. That's so dangerous. And I'm like, oh, but I, you know, so he needs to eat. So I bought him an Arby's burger, he needs but to um, eat. <laughs> yeah, just massive compassion and huge respect for anybody who can, can recover at the age of 16 or 17 or 18. Wow. Like that yep. is just so massive. Cool. So I would say those are, those are some of the biggest things. Wonderful. Well, Brenda, this has been very powerful, very informative, very educational. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. I would love if you would just let our listeners know kind of where they can go if this is what they're dealing with uh, and how to support this mission. Yeah, hopestreamcommunity.org is our website. And you can find everything there as far as our communities, our, our courses, 
um, all of that. We're actually doing a fentanyl webinar that will be up there for uh, people to view a replay of. Really important, um, specifically about fentanyl and teens. So yeah, hopestreamcommunity.org or on Instagram, hopestreamcommunity. Not super good at Instagram because it just takes a lot of time. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> um, but yeah, those are those are the main places to find us. And we're just here to help any parent. And then as far as support, we're a nonprofit. So there's a donation button, Great. <laughs> a donation page. Yeah. We'd love to have support. Um, just It means that we can offer our communities at a um, scholarship rate for anyone who can't afford it. We never turn anybody away. So even if you can afford $1 a month, that's totally cool. We'll, we'll get you in. And the podcast, Hope Stream on Apple, Spotify. All yep. The, all, all the places. All the places. All all the places. places. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. This is a great, great conversation. Of yeah. course. Of course. I'm and in fact, forward to this. I think we'd probably like to have you back yeah. and maybe there's, go a little deeper on some stuff. <laughs> there's so much uh, to talk about. <laughs> it's hard to yeah. do it in an hour. Thank you so much, Brenda. That was thanks that for was being fantastic. here. And thanks for all the work you're doing. The information and opinions shared on this podcast are solely those of the host and guests and are not a substitute for medical advice. If you feel like you may need professional help, here are some resources. Visit Patrick Balsley's practice, sanacounseling.com, Robbie Shaw's practice, eventiderecovery.com, or visit theblanchardinstitute.com.